Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Cutrate Commander, the series where we take a look at low price commanders and make budget decks with them. My name is Grazit and today we'll be looking at a build featuring the last of the levelers, Graz Unstoppable Juggernaut. But before we continue, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe if you like this content and would like me to continue making more videos like this in the future. And if you're feeling particularly generous, please consider buying me a coffee at the link in the description to keep me caffeinated as I work on more of these builds. Also, be sure to stick around until the end of the video to see who won last week's poll and what commanders you'll be voting for for an upcoming episode. So with that out of the way, let's start by taking a look at the commander and playstyle. Graz Unstoppable Juggernaut is a 7-5 artifact creature juggernaut that costs 8 and has the following abilities. All juggernauts we control must attack each combat if able, can't be blocked by walls, and all other creatures we control have base power 5-3 and are juggernauts in addition to their other types. Breaking down its core stats, Graz is sporting a massive CMC, a below average stat block for its cost, and a series of abilities that are aimed at turning our boards into juggernauts and empowering them while doing so. Quickly going over its first two abilities, the compelled attack each turn is more of a liability than anything, forcing us, depending on the board state, to make unfavorable attacks, in addition to making it awkward for us to keep blockers up once our commander comes down. While the evasion it provides against walls is extremely niche and will almost never see any use unless we're up against some very specific builds. So, with its first two abilities either being a hindrance or useless outside of very specific circumstances, Graz's last ability has a lot to make up for, and luckily for us, it is quite potent. Being able to turn our entire board into 5-3s is nothing to scoff at, especially when considering that Graz is a colorless commander that doesn't readily have access to anthems and lords that other colors take for granted, more or less making him an overrun style effect from the command zone that, depending on how wide our board is, can enable us to eliminate a player or even the table as soon as he comes down. So, as we can see, Graz is a very expensive commander that's very capable of powering up a board, but who is limited by its high CMC and colorless color identity, making building around him a bit tricky. That said, I eventually settled on taking this build in an artifact token theme direction to make the most out of his effect, while also helping us to get to him in the first place. Artifacts, after all, have no shortage of token-creating effects that should help us set up our board quite nicely while we build up our mana base to get to our commander, ranging from mass token creation effects to create instant board states for us, to more passive and repeatable sources of token generation that can provide us with a steady stream of bodies turn after turn. Additionally, artifacts also boast an impressive selection of colorless rocks that will not only help us get to our commander quicker, but can also be used to fuel our token creating artifacts to get us even more bodies on board to benefit from our commander when it finally does come online. And of course, we can't forget the wide array of synergistic and general utility effects artifacts provide, allowing us to shore up our core stats despite us only having access to colorless mana. Couple that with a number of naturally evasive creatures that can dodge blockers entirely as they swing in, and we have a very solid creature base to benefit from our commander's stat manipulation. And finally, since I refuse to pay $2 a pop for wastes, we'll be running a whopping 38 unique colorless utility lands in this build, which we'll be using to generate us additional value, to turn into creatures to be empowered by our commander, and or to create additional tokens for us to widen our board state even further. So let's planeswalk back to New Phyrexia and observe Graz, the last of the mighty levelers, the fearsome war machines created by Memnarch when he ruled Mirrodin to crush anything and everything that opposed him. They were once beyond number, but now only Graz remains, having outlasted even its creator, but still following its long dead master's directive. Mirin or Phyrexian, it's all irrelevant. They are all enemies of Memnarch and must be eradicated. And so it continues to stalk New Phyrexia, doomed to follow the will of a long dead madman until it either succeeds or joins its fallen brethren. So, now that we know a bit more about the commander and playstyle, let's start looking at the deck itself by starting with the creatures. 
Starting off in the CMC Zero slot, its first half brings us Hanger Back Walker, a double X cost creature who comes into play with X plus one plus one counters. When it dies, creates a 1 1 flying Thopter token for each counter it had, and we can pay one and tap it to put a plus one plus one counter on it. Its base 0 0 stat block synergizing perfectly with Grass, who turns it into a base 5 3 on top of its plus one plus one counters, and, when it's finally dealt with, leaves behind a throng of flyers who are themselves 5 3s to continue piling on the deck. Damage. Then the second half of this slot brings us Ornithopter, a 0-2 flyer, which with our commander on board is a 0-mana 5-3 with built-in evasion, which is a fantastic rate, and while we wait to summon our commander, we can use it to trigger our artifact payoffs at no cost. Then proceeding to the CMC1 slot, we have a trio of creatures with built-in evasion joining our ranks, those being Ginger Brute, Signal Pest, and Spectrum Sentinel. Ginger Brood is a 1-1 that we can pay 1 to make it unblockable except by creatures with haste until the end of the turn, in addition to letting us pay 2, tap it and sack it to gain 2 life. It's haste-based evasion making it effectively unblockable, which is great once it gets boosted by Graz, and its life gain effect can be situationally useful to help stabilize us in a pinch. Signal Pest is a 0-1 with Battle Cry that can only be blocked by creatures with either flying or reach, more or less making it a flyer on attack to help dodge blockers and its Battle Cry turning all our 5-3s into 6-3s on attack for a bit of extra damage. Spectrum Sentinel is a 1-2 with protection from multicolored and, whenever a non-basic land ETBs under an opponent's control, gains us 1 life. Its built-in protection providing decent evasion and defense against multicolored decks, while its passive life gain generates a surprising amount of life for us if it sticks around considering how rampant non-basic lands are in our format. It's then on to the CMC2 slot, which opens with the Mana Dorks, Hedron Crawler, Mannequin, and Ornithopter of Paradise, all of which tap for a mana, the first being a 0-1 that can tap for a colorless, the second being a 1-1 that also taps for a colorless, and the third being a 0-2 flyer that taps for any color, which we're running as cheap sources of ramp to help speed up our mana base, in addition to being extra 5-3 bodies for us when Graz comes down. Automated Artificer will also find a home here, being a 1-3 that we can tap for a colorless, which we can only spend on abilities or artifact spells, making it a power stone on a body that we can still derive plenty of use from thanks to our high number of artifacts and activated abilities. Then switching gears from ramp to draw, we have Zenith Chronicler, a 3-1 that, whenever a player casts their first multicolored spell each turn, has each other player draw a card, which can, against multicolored decks, draw us an extra 1-3 cards per rotation while giving our opponents nothing on our turns due to us being a colorless deck and us being better able to cast the drawn cards before our opponents thanks to our enormous ramp package. Then as we close in on the end of this slot, we have the pair of Artifacts Matters creatures, Steel Overseer and Patchwork Automaton. Steel Overseer is a 1-1 that we can tap to put a plus one plus one counter on each artifact creature we control, which is solid at increasing our small creatures and token stats on mass while we set up our board, and is even better when they turn into juggernauts to make them even bigger after their stat adjustment. Patchwork Automaton is another 1-1, one, one, this time with Ward 2, that gains a plus one plus one counter whenever we cast an artifact spell. Again, combining low base stats to get maximum value out of Graz and plus one plus one counter generation that's very easy to trigger in this build to make him a decent threat on his own, and an even bigger threat when he inevitably turns into a base 5-3. We'll also be slotting in Mere Retriever in this category, a 1-1 that, when it dies, lets us return another target artifact from our graveyard back to hand, allowing us to recur the vast majority of our deck from the bin upon death, which is likely to occur once it's compelled to swing in after Graz comes into play. And lastly, we have Hovermere closing out the CMC2 slot, which is a 2-1 flyer with Vigilance, serving as another relatively cheap evasive body for us to use alongside our commander, and whose Vigilance will also allow us to use it as a decent blocker after it's been powered up, which this deck severely lacks due to our compelled attacks. Now moving into the CMC3 slot, we're back on the ramp game plan with Foundry Inspector, Palladium Mirror, and Thran Spider. Foundry Inspector is a 3-2 that reduces the cost of all our artifact spells by 1, which translates to a minus 1 cost reduction to about 95% of our deck, making it that much easier to play our creatures and artifacts and still have mana left over to pump into our activated abilities to create tokens or generate value. 
Palladium Amir is a 2-2 that we can tap for 2 colorless, more or less making it a soul ring on legs and as such providing us with a solid boost to our mana base to help us pay for our higher CMC spells and activated abilities that much faster. Thran Spider is a 2-4 with reach that, when it ETBs, creates a tapped power stone for us and one target opponent, and lets us pay 7 to look at the top 4 cards of our deck, letting us reveal an artifact from among them and put it into our hand while sending the rest to the bottom in a random order. The ramp it provides being decent despite being somewhat symmetrical due to the power stone it creates being much more useful to us thanks to our artifact heavy build, and the card selection and draw it provides, while steep in price, should still be no problem for us to pay if we need the draw thanks to this build's massive ramp package. Then pivoting to the Artifacts Matter creatures in this slot, we start off with Liberator, Urza's Battle Thopter, and Shimmer Mirror, both of which have Flash and let us cast our Artifact spells at Flash speed, the former being a 1-2 flyer that also affects colorless spells and gains a plus one plus one counter whenever we cast a spell whose CMC is greater than its power, and the latter being a 2-2 with no other abilities. Their ability to let us play at instant speed being of great use to us in this build in both allowing us to play around removal and wipes by casting our spells on our opponent's turns, as well as granting Graz and any other creatures we cast on those turns pseudo haste so they can swing in as soon as the turn gets back to us. Then up next we have Scrap Trawler, a 3-2 that, whenever it or another artifact we control is sent to the graveyard from the battlefield, lets us return an artifact of lesser CMC from our graveyard back to hand, adding a bit more graveyard recursion to the build that now extends to the vast majority of our deck, allowing our artifacts to replace themselves upon destruction or as we sack them away for value. Then moving on to a more offensive sort of artifact support, we have Chief of the Foundry, a 2-3 that gives all other artifact creatures we control plus one plus one, making it a solid lord that takes our artifact juggernauts from being 5-3s to being 6-4s to make them even deadlier and more likely to survive combat. And then as our final entrant in this slot, we have Etched Champion, a 2-2 that, so long as we control 3 plus artifacts, has protection from all colors, its conditional protection being very easy for us to enable and, once it's online, it makes for a superb blocker initially, and a solid evasive and hard to interact with attacker once our commander comes down. Then reaching the halfway mark of our creature base, the CMC4 slot brings us its only two entrants, Golden Guardian and Joyra's Familiar. Golden Guardian is a 4-4 with Defender that lets us pay 2 to have it fight target creature we control and, if it dies that turn, transforms into Goldforge Garrison, a land that taps for 2 mana of any color and lets us pay 4 and tap it to create a 4-4 artifact creature token. It's on curve stat block making it a decent blocker initially that we can later pay 2 to have it fight a token and die when blocking or simply crash into a bigger creature to not only ramp us but also give us another way to turn our mana into tokens which are large enough to do damage on their own without having to rely on our commander. Joyra's Familiar is a 2-2 flyer that reduces the cost of all our historic spells by 1, again like Foundry Inspector providing a blanket minus 1 cost reduction to most of our deck, while this time being on an evasive body to better swing in with once it becomes a juggernaut. That then brings us to the CMC5 slot, which starts us off with the artifacts matter payoffs, Canoptic Spider, and Mishra Self Replicator. Canoptic Spider is a 4-4 flyer that, whenever a non-token artifact creature or vehicle ETBs under our control, draws us a card, taking full advantage of our high artifact creature count to keep our hands nicely topped off as we cast them for no additional mana cost. Mishra Self Replicator is a 2-2 that, whenever we cast a historic spell, lets us pay 1 to create a token copy of it, this time making full use of our high artifact count and large mana base to absolutely flood the board with an exponentially growing number of self replicators as we cast our spells, all of which will receive a decent stat boost once our commander comes down. Then Blade Griff Prototype wraps up this slot, a 3-2 flyer that, whenever it deals combat damage to a player, destroys target permanent of that player's choice that one of our opponents controls, providing us with a repeatable source of permanent destruction, a rarity in our colors, that may not be completely under our control but should generally get rid of the biggest threats at the table apart from our own. Nearly at the end now, the CMC6 slot opens up with our heaviest hitting artifacts yet, those being Steel Hellkite, Soul of New Phyrexia, and Thopter Assembly. 
Steel Hellkite is a 5-5 flyer that lets us pay 2 to give it plus 1 plus 0 until end of turn, in addition to letting us pay X to destroy each non-land permanent of CMC X that an opponent controls that was dealt damage by Steel Hellkite that turn, limited to once per turn. Like the previous entry, providing us with repeatable permanent destruction, which is this time under our control and is capable of hitting multiple targets, and notably is perfect for clearing an opponent's board of tokens at no mana cost, which would otherwise be able to chump lock our juggernaut knots once they start swinging in. Soul of New Phyrexia is a 6-6 Trampler that lets us pay 5 to make all our permanents indestructible until the end of the turn, or instead pay 5 and exile it from our graveyard to do the same, making it our only creature that actually loses power due to our commander's ability, but making up for it by allowing us to pump our ample mana reserves into keeping our board state intact and our commander alive, which is well worth the trade-off. Thopter Assembly is a 5-5 flyer that, at the beginning of our upkeep if we control no other Thopters other than it, returns back to our hand and creates 5-1-1 flying Thopter tokens, making it less of a 5-5 flyer and more like 5 evasive 1-1s in a trench coat, which is both easy to trigger and gets us 25 power in the air when Graz comes down all on its own, which we can later use to rebuild our board if the initial Thopters it created are destroyed. And then closing out this slot, we have our only non-artifact creature entry, Endbringer. A 5-5 that untaps on each player's untap step and lets us either tap it to deal 1 damage to target creature or player, pay 1 colorless mana and tap it to prevent target creature from attacking or blocking that turn, or pay 2 colorless mana and tap it to draw a card who primarily earns its spot on this list by allowing us to draw 4 cards per rotation at 2 mana a pop, but whose ability to ping 1 can help snipe out small utility creatures or get some free burn in, while its attack and block prevention can help more of our juggernauts get through or prevent our commander from swinging in unfavorably. And finally, reaching the CMC7 slot and the last of our creatures, we have Mere Battlesphere, Pentavus, and Meteor Golem. Mirror Battlesphere is a 4-7 that, when it ETBs, creates 4 1-1 Mirror Artifact creature tokens, and, when it attacks, lets us tap X on tapped Mirror we control to give it plus X plus O until end of turn and have it deal X damage to the player or planeswalker it's attacking, giving us 5 bodies for the price of 1, which is great for helping us build up our board state, and being a viable threat on its own while we wait for the opportunity to summon our commander by using those tokens it creates to turn itself into an 8-7 with added burn as it swings in. Pentavis is a 0-0 that ETBs with 5 plus 1 plus 1 counters and lets us pay 1 and remove a counter from it to create a 1-1 flying Pentavite artifact creature token, or pay 1 and sack a Pentavite to put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on Pentavis. Again, providing us with another creature that can generate evasive bodies for us, which if our commander's on board doesn't even die to its own effect thanks to being a base 5-3 with no counters on it. Meteor Golem is a 3-3 that, when it ETBs, destroys target permanent, giving our build another much needed piece of removal to help us deal with our opponent's threats, which again leaves behind a body for our commander to power up when it comes down. That covers all our creatures, so let's move on to our instance. Our singular instance joins us in the CMC7 slot, that being Scour from Existence, which exiles target permanent, costing us a premium to cast but being one of the few flash speed interaction pieces we have in our colors, and since we have the mana base to support it, we'll run it. That covers our lone instant, so let's move on to our sorceries. Like the previous category, we're only running a single sorcery in this build, the CMC5 Introduction to Annihilation, which exiles target non-land permanent and has its controller draw a card, giving us another piece of non-artifact based removal for us to use, which is admittedly slow and replaces the card it destroys, but lacking better options will run it regardless. That covers our only sorcery, and with no enchantments to cover, let's move straight into our artifacts. Beginning in the CMC0 slot, we open with the Mana Rock Everflowing Chalice, which has multi-kicker for 2, ETBs with a charge counter for every time it was kicked, and we can tap to generate a colorless mana for each charge counter on it, which at worst we can use as a 2-drop Mana Rock, which is serviceable, but produces more and more mana for us the more mana we can pump into it, which is perfect for getting to our commander faster or fueling the abilities of our mana-hungry artifacts. Artifacts like Arichi Hatchery, a double X spell that ETBs with X charge counters on it and lets us pay 5 and tap it to create a 1-1 snake creature token for each charge counter it has, 
requiring at least eight mana or more to be pumped into it to make it viable, which thankfully our mana base can supply, but in exchange allowing us to get 20 plus power on the battlefield per activation with our commander in play, which is well worth the initial mana investment. We then move on to the CMC1 slot and its lone entry, Soul Ring, which taps for two colorless, which again helps speed up our mana base considerably to help summon our commander or activate our abilities. And then we stay on the Mana Rock game plan as we enter the CMC2 slot with its first three entrants, Ebony Fly, Guardian Idol, and Mindstone. Ebony Fly comes into play tapped, taps for a colorless, and lets us pay four to roll a d6, turning into an XX Flyer based on the result until end of turn, that, when it attacks, gives another target attacking creature flying until end of turn as well, making it a decent mana rock initially that later turns into an evasive body that not only has a four and six chance of being stronger than what we actually roll thanks to our commander, but also grants Graz evasion to ensure our commander doesn't die due to blockers on the ground as it cracks in. Guardian Idol comes into play tapped, taps for a colorless, and lets us pay 2 to turn it into a 2-2 two -two until the end of the turn. Again, providing us with another rock that we can turn into a body to really build up our board when we're ready to push for lethal. Mind Stone taps for a colorless and lets us pay 1, tap it and sack it to draw a card. Serving as yet another solid, low-cost rock that also gives us the option to cantrip it if we have too much mana and need to dig for resources, which is always a nice option to have. And then, as this slot's closing entries, we have the equipment Swiftfoot Boots and Inquisitorial Rosette. Swiftfoot Boots equips for one and grants the equipped creature Hexproof and Haste, making it an excellent way to protect Grass so he sticks around for longer and allowing him to swing in as soon as he comes down to help pile on the damage. Inquisitorial Rosette equips for three and, whenever the equipped creature attacks, creates a 2-2 with Vigilance that's also attacking and grants all attacking creatures menace until end of turn. The free 5-3 with every swing with our commander in play being nice, but the AoE menace it provides being even better to ensure that less of our juggernauts get blocked and are able to get in for maximum damage. Now entering the CMC3 slot, we open with a pair of token generators, those being Golem Foundry and Nuisance Engine. Golem Foundry, whenever we cast an artifact spell, gains a charge counter, and lets us remove three charge counters from it to create a 3-3 artifact creature token, which, thanks to our high volume of artifacts in the build, will be able to provide us with a steady stream of decent sized bodies for us as the game progresses, or that we can create all at once when we're ready to alpha strike with our commander. Nuisance Engine lets us pay 2 and tap it to create a 0-1 artifact creature token, making it another continual source of tokens, which are admittedly small, but do give us something to do with our huge mana base and later turn into 5-3s, which makes it a bit more palatable. Sculpting Steel then gets slotted into the build as another artifact payoff, which can ETB as a copy of any artifact on the battlefield, allowing us to double up on our most powerful token generators and artifact payoffs to generate us even more board presence and value. And lastly, we close out the CMC3 slot with Worn Power Stone, which comes into play tapped and taps for two colorless, serving as another well-costed mana rock to help fuel our game plan even further. And while on the topic of mana rocks, the CMC4 slot opens with another one in the form of Hedron Archive, which also taps for two colorless and lets us pay two, tap it and sack it to draw two cards, making it a decent if expensive rock that, if we have more mana than we have spells and abilities to spend it on, we can always sack away to dig for more resources. Then switching gears from ramp to draw, we'll be slotting in Mystic Forge and a Trading Post. Mystic Forge lets us look at the top card of our deck at any time, cast artifact or colorless spells off the top of our deck, and tap it and pay one life to exile the top card of our deck. Its artifact side effect effectively granting us an extra card in hand that replaces itself as we play it, while its top deck exile is great for clearing away lands that would otherwise prevent us from playing off the top. Trading Post lets us pay one and tap it for one of the following effects. Discard a card to gain four life, pay one life to create a 0-1 goat, sack a creature to return an artifact from our grave back to hand, or sack an artifact to draw a card. Its token creation, artifact recursion, and draw all synergizing perfectly with our artifact and token themed game plan, and even its life gain being useful in a pinch if we really need that extra life to stay in the game. 
From there, it's on to some rather unique token creators as we pass this lot's halfway mark, namely Prototype Portal and Soul Foundry, both of which, when they ETB, have us exile a card from our hand, the former exiling an artifact and the latter exiling a creature, and then letting us pay X and tap them to create a token copy of that card, where X is the exiled card's CMC, each providing us with the means to get additional copies of our most powerful artifacts and creatures into play turn after turn, which is admittedly powerful, but can end up 2 for one us if our opponents remove them, so it's best to play them on a turn we can afford to activate them to prevent that from happening. Then we have Throne of Empires joining us as a more traditional token generator, which lets us pay 1 and tap it to create a 1-1, one -one, giving us a simple, cheap, and repeatable source of bodies to pump mana into turn after turn, which is exactly what this deck wants to be able to set up the board for our commander. And then as our last entrant in this slot, we have the equipment Dragon Throne of Tarkir, which equips for 3, grants the equipped creature Defender, and lets us pay 2 and tap the equipped creature to give all other creatures we control trample and plus X plus X until the end of the turn, where X is equal to the equipped creature's power. Working very nicely when equipped to grass to provide a board-wide plus 7 plus 7 stat bump on top of what our commander already provides, as well as trample to allow our creatures to crash through blockers with impunity, with the added benefit of keeping our commander from swinging in wildly into established board states and getting himself killed. Nearly at the end now, the CMC5 slot is up next with its three entrants, Mind's Eye, Mirror Works, and the Might Stone and Weak Stone. Mind's Eye, whenever an opponent draws a card, lets us pay one to draw a card as well, allowing us to easily draw at least three cards per rotation at the low rate of one mana a pop, and easily reloading our hands entirely off other players' draw engines and spells thanks to our enormous mana base. Mirror Works, whenever a non-token artifact ETBs under our control, lets us pay two to create a token copy of it, again allowing us to use our massive mana reserves to get extra copies of our artifacts into play at a relatively low cost, and helping our board go even wider. The Might Stone and Weak Stone, when they ETB, have us choose one of the following effects. Either we draw two cards, or have target creature lose minus five minus five until the end of the turn. In addition to letting us tap it for two colorless, which we can't spend to cast non-artifact spells. The card advantage, non-destruction removal and ramp they provide, helping us pad our build's core stats quite nicely. And finally, reaching the CMC 6 slot, we have our final artifact, Dreamstone Hedron, which taps for 3 colorless, and we can pay 3, tap it and sack it to draw 3, making it an even bigger Hedron archive to provide us with more ramp and, if necessary, draw, both of which we can always use more of. That covers all our artifacts, so let's move on to our Planeswalkers. Our first of two Planeswalkers joins us in the CMC4 slot, that being Karn Living a Legacy, who comes into play with 4 loyalty and has the following abilities. His plus 1 creates a tapped Power Stone token, his minus 1 lets us pay any amount of mana and then look at that many cards off the top of our deck, letting us put 1 into our hand and sending the rest to the bottom of our deck in a random order, and his minus 7 gives us an emblem that lets us tap an untapped artifact we control to have it deal 1 damage to any target. The ramp, card selection, and card advantage he provides padding our core stats quite nicely, and his ult, if we can get to it, gives us a bit of extra reach to help close out games with our non-creature artifacts. Then skipping to the CMC6 slot, we have our second walker, Ugin the Ineffable, who also comes into play with 4 loyalty and has the following abilities. His passive makes all our colorless spells cost 2 less to cast, his plus 1 exiles the top card of our deck face down and creates a 2-2 spirit token that, when it leaves the battlefield, puts the exiled card into our hand, and his minus 3 destroys target permanent that's one or more colors, which results in his entire kit working very well in this build. From his passive providing us with a blanket minus 2 cost reduction for our entire deck, his plus 1 creating more bodies for grass to turn into juggernauts that later turn into card advantage, and his minus 3 providing incredibly flexible permanent destruction that's capable of dealing with almost any type of threat we may encounter, making him well worth the cost. That covers all our planeswalkers, so let's move on to our land base. Due to us running 38 unique lands in this build, I'll only be briefly going over the land entries we'll be running in a number of different categories in order to be able to cover them all in a timely manner, which we'll be starting off with our mana lands, those being Guild Commons, Shrine of the Forsaken Gods, Urza's Mine, Urza's Power Plant, and Urza's Tower. 
all of which are capable of generating 2 plus mana by default or conditionally to help speed up our already impressive mana base, as well as Hall of Tagsin and Majoring Network, which only generate 1 colorless but are capable of ramping us by creating power stones or stockpiling mana to build up our mana base even further. It's then on to some card advantage generating lands with Arch of Araska, Bonders Enclave, Seagate Wreckage, and War Room, all of which allow us to draw cards by default or conditionally by pumping mana into them, making them great ways to replenish our hands throughout the course of the game. From there, we have a series of man lands to help us further build up our board presence, those being Crawling Barons, Dread Statuary, Hostile Desert, Mishra's Factory, Mishra's Foundry, and Mobilized District, all of which can turn themselves into creatures until the end of the turn, Stalking Stones, which can permanently turn itself into a creature, and Zoetic Cavern, which has Morph to allow us to play it as a 2-2, all of which give us the option to turn our land base into additional creatures while our commander's in play to get that extra bit of reach that can be the difference between successfully alpha striking an opponent or not. Then staying on the game plan of using our lands to generate board presence, we have some token generating lands up next, with Mirix, Springjack Pasture, and Urza's Factory all allowing us to continually generate tokens with their activated abilities, and Cradle of the Accursed, Foundry of the Consoles, Gargoyle Castle, and Spawning Bed all letting us crack them to create tokens if we have more mana than we know what to do with. Again, allowing us to use our land base to build up our board and gain maximum benefit from Graz once he comes down. Then quickly running down our remaining utility lands, we have Crystal Grotto and Zelfirin Void, both of which scry one when they ETB to provide some decent card selection, Radiant Fountain, which gains us 2 life on ETB to help pad our life totals, Buried Ruin, which allows us to recur artifacts from the bin to be used again, Cave of Temptation, which we can sack to permanently grow our commander with two plus one plus one counters to allow it to hit harder and more easily survive swinging in. Rogue's Passage, which we can use to make our commander evasive so it can crack in with impunity. Tyrite Sanctum, which we can use to eventually make Graz indestructible and thereby even more resilient against our opponent's removal attempts against it. Tomb of the Spirit Dragon, which gains us life depending on the number of colorless creatures we control, which considering we're a colorless deck can be a decent chunk per activation. Phyrexia's Core, which lets us sack an artifact to gain life, allowing us to get some extra value out of artifacts that would be destroyed anyway. Cryptic Caves, which we can sack to draw a card if we find ourselves with too much mana and not enough to spend it on. Blast Zone, which is decent removal or even a partial wipe from the land slot to help us deal with problematic board states. And lastly, Ruins of Orin Reef, which lets us put an extra plus one plus one counter on our colorless creatures as they come into play for that extra stat boost that carries over when Graz comes down. So, now that we've covered all the cards in the deck, let's take a look at this deck's breakdown. This deck currently has 35 creatures including the commander, 1 instant, 1 sorcery, 0 enchantments, 23 artifacts, 2 planeswalkers, and 38 lands. Looking at the stats that matter to our game plan, we have 57 cards that are considered artifacts, 20 cards that care about artifacts, 23 sources of token generation, 8 lands that turn themselves into creatures, and 17 cards with built-in evasion or the ability to grant evasion to other creatures, giving us a solid artifact foundation to build our deck on with all the self-synergy that comes with it, a decent number of ways to get additional bodies into play via tokens and animating our land base, and a solid number of evasive creatures and evasion-granting sources to ensure they can bypass blockers and crack in for maximum damage once our commander comes down. For general deck stats, we have 21 ramp sources, 16 card draw sources, 10 targeted removal sources, and 2 board wipes. Our ramp package being well above average in this build to help us get to the mana necessary to cast our commander and pay for our various activated abilities. Our draw being above average as well, as a decent chunk of it is tied into our land base that doesn't take up other slots to accommodate for it. And our removal and wipes falling within more typical numbers, though it should be noted that our wipes are only partial ones. Then looking at our mana curve, we have 4 0 drops, 4 1 drops, 14 2 drops, 12 3 drops, 10 4 drops, 7 5 drops, 6 6 drops, 4 7 drops, and 1 8 drop. 
leaving us with a hefty mana curve that aims to ramp as hard as possible in the early to mid game, sinking our amassed mana into activated abilities to help us flood the board with tokens and evasive creatures until we're ready to drop our commander, who turns all those bodies into 5-3s and lets us crash them into our opponents until they're ground to dust under the treads of our juggernauts. Currently this deck is valued at 6481, not counting the price of basic lands or shipping. This price was calculated by using the cheapest listed marketplace price on TCG Player at the time of this recording. For side grades, Guardian Idol can be exchanged out for Captain's Claws if we want to cut some ramp for more token creation that works nicely with our evasive creatures, Thran Spider can be swapped out for Geode Golem, which does reduce our ramp but gives us the opportunity to get our commander into play at no cost, which is risky but sometimes worth it, Mind's Eye can be replaced with Tamiyo's Journal if we're willing to sacrifice more draw for the ability to slowly tutor anything from our deck, and we can consider trading the Might and Meek Stone for an expedition map to help us tutor for the various utility lands we're running and more easily assemble our Tron lands. Then for upgrades, Cave of Temptation can be terraformed into Urza's Workshop to give us some additional ramp that works well with our other Urza lands, Golden Guardian can be shelved for Crypto Thrall, whose AoE hexproof for all our artifacts makes it very difficult for our opponents to deal with our threats, Scour from Existence can be exchanged out for All is Dust, which is more or less a one-sided wipe for us save for a few tokens that will send our opponents back to nothing while leaving us mostly untouched. Mirror Works can be scrapped in favor of Forsaken Monument, which has a much more immediate impact on the board with its Anthem effect and doubling our mana base, and then generating passive life gain for us afterwards, and Soul of New Phyrexia can be smelted down to make room for Darksteel Forge, which makes most of our deck immune to conventional removal as soon as it hits the board. And lastly, we can raise Ruins of Oren Reef and put an Ancient Tomb in its place, which taps for two colorless right out of the gate to improve our mana base even further, though we may need to start plundering Ancient Tombs ourselves if we want to afford it in the first place. Thanks everyone for sticking around until the end of the video. Before we continue, I would first like to take a moment to thank all the channel subs for having helped us reach the 9.9k and 10k subscriber milestones. Thanks to all of your continued support, the channel has finally been able to crack the 5 digit mark, so thank you all for helping the channel grow over the past 2 years. Moving on to the results of last week's poll, it looks like Solfim Mayhem Dominus was able to come out on top in the Battle of the Domini, so look forward to a mono-red burn-focused build featuring him coming soon. Then regarding this week's poll, we'll actually be putting the polls on hold for now, as likely next week we'll be dropping the Mystery Commander build for the 10k giveaway, and we still have to cover Chiscori and Solfim before we get a fresh set of 5 new commander decks that we have to make pre-con upgrade guides for for March of the Machine. So instead, I'd like to hear from you. Let me know in the comments below which commander spoiled so far for March of the Machine you want to see me cover in future builds so I can begin prepping the polls once we're done covering the pre-con upgrades. And before we close out, again, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe if you haven't done so already, as this channel can't continue to grow without your support. And if you feel like showing your thanks by keeping me caffeinated while I make these videos, please consider buying me a coffee at the link in the description. And speaking of which, I would like to thank Barry yet again for another generous donation. Thanks for the continual influx of caffeine, Barry, and thank you for supporting the channel. And if any of you would like to support the channel in a different way, feel free to check out the other deck techs floating around my head if you'd like to see the latest builds, or click on the link above for a playlist of all the Cutrate Commander episodes I've made so far. And with that, have a good one folks, and stay safe.